Good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you're here this morning. If you're joining us by way of the internet or Facebook, we're so glad that you're here with us. Thank you so much for the opportunity to serve, and this is a great way for us to be able to get the Word of God out to the airways, and we're so delighted in that. I'm going to ask you, if you will, at the end of the service, you're going to be, in, um, you were seated by a greeter. We're also going to uh, just escort you out by road just so that we can maintain social distancing. Let's please uh, stand together. Well, it's, uh, boy, that's hot. It's uh, so good to see all of you here. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll read the text uh, for this morning. All of you look like you're getting ready to rob a liquor store. <laughs> and so uh, it's, uh, it's so good to see you from here up to here up. So let me, uh, let me, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, and uh, you have done great things in our lives, and we're thankful that you will continue to do uh, great things, and we bless you and we worship you today uh, for that. We thank you, Lord, for your protection of us uh, during a very unstable time in our world. We thank you for bringing us back to this place. We thank you for folks who are watching online. We pray uh, that they would hear from you, and Lord, that we would hear from you here today and from your word uh, as well. And so, uh, Lord, we pray for the peace of our nation. Uh, we, um, Lord, we, I, I personally have never seen such upheaval. And so uh, we pray that people might will come to know uh, the friend and that they would uh, uh, experience the peace that passes all understanding and then uh, our nation will be a peaceful place. And so uh, we pray 
you would speak to us through your word today. We would uh, pray that um, we would understand how you work, uh, maybe even when we don't realize that and don't see that as we look at a part uh, of a life, uh, and an episode here from the uh, life of Ruth. And so uh, we give you this day and these uh, requests. We make them in the name and behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Come your Bible to um, yeah. There we, now we are. All right. Ruth chapter 3, and I'll read the chapter uh, in its entirety. If you've been watching online, you know that I am preaching through uh, the little book of Ruth. This is my Mother's Day gift to all you uh, ladies. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women were with you, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, All that you say to me I will do. So she went down the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie, lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative, however, there is a relative closer than I. Say this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I'll perform the duty for you. As the Lord lives, lie down until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before she, anyone could, before one could recognize her. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. When she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Brother Brian. Let's remain standing as we sing this song, Made Me Glad. Let, let that be our prayer today, that we'll bless the Lord, we'll trust him at all times. I will bless the Lord forever. Trust in man all time. He has delivered me from all fear. He has set my feet on a rock. And I will not, and I. 
Ruth chapter 3, I've sometimes said that life is best understood uh, looking backwards at the events of our life because many times standing looking backwards we can see that uh, there have been so many times in our lives when God was at work behind the scenes and we did not know that he was at work behind the scenes until sometime later. Um, this story in Ruth chapter 3 is one of those such episodes in the life of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz where God was at work behind the scenes. And that's why I've entitled the message, God's Work Behind the Scenes. And sometimes we'll go through an episode or an event in our life and have time to kind of sit down and examine it and look back at it and make a comment like this. Well, the Lord was surely working in that matter or that event. And um, I want us to just look real quickly in these 18 verses this morning uh, and see that uh, what we do learn from this story is that God is at work uh, behind the scenes uh, of our lives, and he was at work behind the scenes uh, in the life of Ruth in order to bring her a kinsman redeemer and uh, what I want us to see particularly this morning is that many times God is at work in our lives even though we are not aware of it and how can we uh, assure ourselves uh, that God may be at work in our lives behind the scene uh, even though we may not be aware of it well let me look at what I'm going to call uh, three instances of when God may be working in our lives even though we may not be aware of it. Instance number one is in verses one through five. God works in situations when we act in faith. Now listen at the beginning of verse, uh, at, at verse one at the beginning of chapter three, this story begins and ends the very, very similar ways with Naomi and Ruth in conversation with one another. Then there's the conversation between Boaz and Ruth in the middle. And again, it ends with the conversation between Ruth and Naomi. Naomi says to Ruth, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you in that it may be well with you? You may have a center column reference there that shows you that that word security means rest. And the word is even used in the last verse of this chapter when the two women are recounting the events when Ruth went to the threshing floor to see Boaz when it says 
sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter to this day. Now, what Naomi was referring to, to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, was uh, in a roundabout way, she was referring to marriage. And she's referring to the fact that she was going to do everything within her power to help Ruth find a mate. And then she could be at physical rest from uh, working in the barley field. Uh, she could be at r uh, all kind of rest once she had a husband who would uh, take care of her, who would see after her, who would uh, meet all the needs that she has. But there's a larger theme that's going on in this passage here. If we were to go back to the book of Joshua especially and even do some reading in the book of Hebrews, we would learn why did God bring Israel into the promised land. God brought Israel into the promised land in order to give them rest from their enemies. And in the book of Hebrews, uh, we read about the fact that uh, the reason the uh, children of Israel walked around in the wilderness is because by faith, uh, when they received the report of the spies, they would not step out in faith and go into the wilderness and claim that by faith and have the rest that God was giving them. And so in a little bit different kind of way, this is somewhat of the same kind of rest. And what Naomi was proposing to Ruth was going to have to be accomplished by faith. This is a wild plan for the day and age that it happened. There were so many things that could have gone wrong. And so Naomi said, essentially, Ruth, uh, my daughter-in-law, I want to do everything to where I can help you find rest. Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? Did you know if you listened to the sermon last week in chapter 2, this supposed chance meeting in the field by Ruth and Boaz realized that Boaz was a relative of Ruth's late uh, father-in-law. And so here's a chance for him to be her kinsman redeemer to fulfill the, uh, the duties of leveret marriage uh, and for him to take care of her uh, for the rest of her life. And that's what Naomi's referring to here in verse 2. She says, go to the, where he's wintering barley tonight at the threshing floor. After barley and wheat were harvested... And remember, we read in verse 23 at the end of chapter 2 that this event happens uh, during the barley harvest. Well, after the barley was harvested, it was carried to the threshing floor, which was many times an elevated place somewhere near the field. It was thrown in the air during a light wind for the wind to carry the chaff away. The seed would fall. The men would then gather up the seed, the grain, and they would store it until it needed to be consumed. And so Boaz and his men, they're at the threshing floor at night. Sometimes they went there at night to protect it from thieves or to protect the harvest from animals. And she said, uh, go wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on your best garment. It's possible that Ruth was still dressed like a widow. It's possible that she was still during that time of mourning. And her mother-in-law, Naomi, here suggests that she put on, quote, normal clothes or regular clothes. And she said, do, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And then it shall be when he lies down, you shall notice where he lies, and she shall go in and uncover his feet and lie down. And again, this is very risky. Ruth was essentially to hide and watch Boaz at a distance until he had in a full day's work. He had a stomach of good food. He had a... Uh, a little adult beverage to drink here. And then when he was to lay down and go to sleep, uh, Ruth was to go in and uncover his feet. Now, if you're familiar maybe a little bit with the Old Testament law and you were to go back and read, particularly in the book of Leviticus, this phrase uncover uh, is used all throughout the Old Testament law to describe uh, literally uncovering someone and seeing uh, them without any clothes on or their nakedness. And sometimes it's used even as a euphemism for uh, sexual relations. I do not believe that is the instance, that is the I I situation going on in this passage because in verse 11, Boaz refers to Ruth as a virtuous woman. And even back in chapter 2, 
the human author of Ruth refers to Boaz as a man who had a good uh, standing in the community. The word that he uses for him, that here. So I think there's no hitting meaning, meaning here, no double entendre, none of those things. The issue was that Naomi told Ruth to uncover his feet so that his feet would get cold and he would wake up and he would notice that she was there. I think that's all that's going on in this story. And and Naomi tells Ruth here at the end of verse 4, when he wakes up, he's going to tell you what to do. And Ruth said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. Did they have any guarantee that this would work? No. Uh, and again, this is a bold plan. This is a bold plan by two women, one of them a foreigner, both of them widows, both of them not really well known to Boaz, just knowing him after this chance meeting sometime during this barley harvest time of a few weeks or a few months. And so it is a very daring and it is a very bold plan that I think it is safe to say that Naomi had because of her faith in God. And that's all that she had. One commentator on this passage said this, A significant theological point emerges here. Earlier Naomi had wished these same things, re referring to marriage for Ruth. Here human means, or Naomi's plan, carry out something previously understood to be in God's providence. And I, and I spoke of that last week, the providence of God. In response to providentially given opportunity, Naomi began to answer her own prayer. Thus she models one way in which divine and human actions work together. Believers are not to wait passively for events to happen. Rather, they must seize the initiative when an opportunity presents itself. They assume that God presents the opportunity. So it's the difference between sitting around and Ruth praying for a husband and Naomi praying for a husband versus the two of them praying and seeking God for Ruth the husband and then stepping out in faith and doing something about their prayer as well. And so this is kind of like sitting around and praying for a job and not going anywhere and filling out a job application or getting a resume filled out. You understand what I'm saying? That's the principle here. The principle is that we can know that God is working behind the scenes in our lives if we step out in faith and trust Him. You and I are not making anything happen. But many times when we step out in faith and act in faith in God, opportunity meets us on the way, and that's exactly what happened here in this story. And so we need to be reminded that everything related to our relationship with Jesus uh, and God the Father is all of faith, and it is never by sight. And so I can be assured today that God is working behind the scenes in my life when I'm living by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 4 speaks about this rest that was available for the children of Israel, and yet they failed to receive it because they would not step out in faith. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Specifically there, he speaks about the rest from sin in our relationship with Jesus. This same principle is illustrated in the story of Peter walking on the water in Matthew 14, 29 through 31. Jesus spoke to Peter and said, Come. Yet would Peter ever have experienced the miracle of walking on the water if he had not stepped out in faith to what Jesus had said? No. And then when he quit keeping his eyes on Jesus and when he looked at the circumstances, and, and instead of looking at Jesus, he began to sink, and Jesus said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And, of course, we're reminded by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I believe that's really what's going on in this passage with the words of Naomi to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is she's essentially saying this, You have got to step out in faith. Believing that when you step out, believing that God is going to work and God is going to move, that he is going to work some way, somehow, behind the scenes. Instance number two, God works in situations when we act in godly action. Look at verses 6 through 15. She went down the threshing floor. She watches Boaz, verse 7. 
He's eating, drinking. His heart was cheerful. He's probably exhausted after a day of working in the barley field. We saw last week in chapter 2. He's unusual in that he is seen with his men and his servants in the barley field. That was not a common behavior of men in his day. We even saw in chapter 2 he sits down and he eats with those who are in the barley field. Both of those indicate that he was a man of great humility and a man of great understanding. And so he's probably very, very tired. And all of us know what a day of working hard, how that most times helps us to go to sleep. And he lie down at the end of the bed. She came and she uncovered his feet and she lay down. His feet was either covered with his cloak or some other kind of garment of some kind. And it says it happened at midnight. Maybe about the time that the air, the dry air of the Middle East turned just a little bit cool and maybe uh, his feet got a little bit cold and he woke up. I've done this and I'm sure you have too. And it says uh, he was startled, verse 8, and he turned himself and there was a woman lying at his feet. Now if that won't startle you, I don't know what will, you know. Maybe I'm the only person that's ever woken up at night and had that dream that anybody was that somebody was standing in the bedroom. Anybody ever had that dream other than me wake up? Now that's enough to startle you. And, and this wasn't a dream. This was real. There was literally a woman lying at his feet, and he said, "Who in the world are you? And what are you doing here?" And she and it must have been dark because he knew her. He had met her in the field, and so I think it's safe to assume it was very, very dark, and he could see maybe the outline uh, of a figure there, and he said, who are you? She said, it's Ruth. Notice twice that she refers to herself as a maidservant. She refers to herself as a servant. She speaks about herself with much humility. And what does she say? She says, take me under your wing, for you are a close relative. Now, this phrase should sound familiar because last week we heard something very similar in chapter 2, verse 20. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a close relation to ours. He is a close relative. And that is not where I was supposed to be reading yet. It's in there somewhere. You've just got to trust me. I wrote down the wrong thing. But there is a reference in chapter 2, I think from the words of Boaz. Uh, um, here it is, verse 12. It says, um, the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. And that's in verse 12 of chapter 2 and that comes off the lips of Boaz about Ruth turning her back on Moab and coming to be a citizen of the nation of Israel. She uses that same language here but she's not speaking about covering from the Lord. She's speaking about covering from Boaz. What's she asking him? Here's what she's asking him. Will you marry me? Very, again, very, very bold action. Why? She's a foreigner and he's an Israelite. She is an unknown person in the community. She's just arrived there a short time ago. He is a man well known in the community. She is a widow who has nothing and he is a man of means, of properties and servants and fields and all those kind of things. We'll see here in a minute he commends her because she doesn't go after younger men, which I think it's safe to assume what? He is an older man and she is a younger woman. And yet she says what? She says, please marry me. And folks, listen to me. It's dark. He's cold. He's had a little to drink. She's young. He's older. It only takes a little bit of imagination to imagine what possibly could have happened in this instance if only one of these people were of low virtue. What very well could have happened. And the conversation continues, and he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. And he could have said what? well, won't you come on up here and get next to me and help me get warm? But he pronounces a blessing upon her. He could have said this, get away from me and get back home. Who do you think you are sliding up here against me and uncovering my feet? 
Who, who do you think you are spying on me? Who do you think you are watching me? You don't have my permission to be here. Why don't you leave? Why don't you get from here? For you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. And again, he, he reacts so kind, so gracious, and commends her for even being more kind than at the beginning. The beginning was what? Probably the first time they met in the field back in chapter 2. And he says, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. He said, you know that you could have had somebody much more younger and possibly even somebody with much more money than me. My daughter, do not fear what I'll do to you. I know that you are a virtuous woman. Again, that underscores the fact that we know there was no hanky-panky going on here or anything like that. That's a Hebrew word, hanky-panky. Uh, now it is true, verse 12, that I am a close relative, but here's a possible kink in the story. There is a relative closer than I am. So this is the first time in this story that we learn what? That there's a possibility of somebody else being the goel, which is the Hebrew word for redeemer. So it tells us what? It tells us that Boaz is under really no direct obligation to be her kinsman redeemer and as her redeemer, according to the Old Testament law, he really doesn't have to marry her. That is an option to him, but again, we see him before this story is over with doing what? Going above and beyond anything that is expected of him. He says, stay the night. He says, and essentially, if your relative will not do it, I will, I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. Well, how in the world could she lie down until morning and sleep? Here's a man who just said, what? Sure, I'll marry you. Sure, I'll take care of you for the rest of my life or the rest of your life or whatever happens. And it says, they rose until morning before anyone could recognize her. It's still dark. And he orders his men, what? Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Why? What is going to happen in this region when a bunch of men say, we saw Ruth leaving early in the morning under the cover of darkness from the threshing floor where Boaz was spending the night? Telegraph, telephone, telebabbies. I mean, that's very well what could have happened in this story. And again, what's going on? We see the virtue and the godliness of both of these people in this instance. Boaz and Ruth are doing everything above board and all that they know according to the law and according to everything that had been revealed in uh, Israel as far as Boaz and even Ruth as a Moabite and not being privileged to the Old Testament law. This shows that both of these people are trying to act in the most uh, godly way that they know how. Verse 15, Boaz says, bring the shawl, the word here is for an outer garment, not the garment that's worn closest to the skin. And he said, and when she held it, he measured out six ephahs. That word is in italics, which means it's been supplied there because the Hebrew just says, and he measured six of barley. So the Editors assumed it's ephahs, it may be six scoops, it may be six handfuls. We know that it wasn't too heavy so that she could not put it back on her back. And why did he do this? And he said, um, and laid it on her, then she went into their city. What had he already done? He had already told her that she could glean in his field, and he ordered in chapter 2 for his servants to deliberately drop grain and barley so that she could glean and pick that up. And after looking at how much she worked and how long she worked, it's safe to assume that she gleaned and picked up enough barley to last for as much as nine months in chapter 2. And Boaz continues to do what here? By allowing, by filling up the shawl, he is continuing to do be what? He is continuing to be kind and gracious and merciful. So what do we need to learn from this passage here. It is always right to be godly and Christ-like in any and every situation in our life. God always blesses godly behavior. There are always consequences when we sin. And here are two people doing what? Here are two people in a situation moving with godly action. Moving with 
sexual ethics, generosity, kindness, all those kinds of things. Proverbs 16, 2, all the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. What's really important in this passage is what's going on in the heart and the mind and the will of both Boaz and Ruth. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the hearts. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And here is a man and a woman who without probably in conscious of the fact that God was working, they acted godly when nobody was watching and nobody was paying attention and nobody was there to record their actions and pay any attention and it's dark and it's cold and it's alone and nobody's there but them and they both chose to act in a godly way in a way that made much of the Lord. You and I can be assured that God works in situations, first of all, where we're moving and living by faith. And by secondly, when we're living and demonstrating godly actions. And lastly, God works in situations when we act in love for other people. Verses 16 through 18. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Was Naomi laying there awake wondering, Well, I wonder how it went. Was she able to sleep? Was she awake? And remember now, it's before daylight. It's still dark. Is she awaiting on Ruth to come back and give her the news? Is she able to sleep? Did she hear the door rustle? Did she hear the dog bark outside whenever uh, Ruth came back to her home? She said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. What does that show us? That shows us that Boaz was not only thinking about Ruth, but he was also thinking about Naomi. Boaz con continues to demonstrate in this story that he is a man of utmost humility and respect and care and concern for other people. He, who is he? He's a picture of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. He's our redeemer, who's a picture of our redeemer who's redeemed us from sin. Our Savior who is kind, who is holy, who is gracious, all those kind of things. And in the middle of the night when my feet's cold and I wake up in the middle of the night and there's somebody there in my bedroom who is not supposed to be there, I'm not for sure that one of the things I'm going to be thinking about is other people. I'm going to be thinking about what in the world are you doing here and what's the easiest way for me to get you out of here and what are we going to do about my cold feet is what, we got, is what I'm going to be worrying about in the middle of the night. And I'm not going to be worried about protecting somebody else's, not really protecting somebody's reputation, but maintaining their reputation. She didn't need to be protected. She just needed someone to continue to speak up for her. And so he says what? You go home, if your near kinsman redeemer won't handle this, I will, and by the way, here's something for your mother-in-law. And she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out, for the man will not rest. And again, there's the idea of what? This man is going to give you rest. This man is going to protect you. This man is going to see after you, and it is a reminder of what? the wonderful rest that God gives us in Jesus Christ and that we receive that by faith alone. Jesus in Matthew 22, 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And who is your neighbor? It's not just the person next door. Naomi and Ruth were not only near kin to Boaz, but they were his neighbors as well. They were people that he encountered who had a real need and he loved them as he loved himself. Jesus told his disciples in John 13, A new commandment I give you, you love one another as I have loved you. You also love one another, and by this all will know that you're my disciples, if you love for one another. It is never wrong to 
love people. It is never wrong to love people. God blesses us when we love people. It is always wrong to hate somebody. Folks, listen to me. You know what's wrong in our country today and related to race relations and all these other things? Listen to me. You don't even have to watch the news today. I'm fixing to give you this free. And I'm fixing to give it to you in one word. And it's going to be real easy. And you're going to remember this when you leave. Here it is. You know what the problem is? Hatred. 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 We don't have race issues in our country. We have hatred issues in our country. We don't have issues where people can't get along with the police or, or whatever that. We have hatred issues. We have people in our country who hate order. And they're doing everything they can in the world to create disorder. That's what Amit, this terrorist organization, Amita, that's what they want. They want chaos. They want anarchy. They hate the government. My Bible says in Romans 13 that the government is a blessing sent from God. And so, folks, listen to me. I know that the Lord is always on my side when I'm doing what? When I love people. When I love my neighbor as myself. I know God's always on my side when I'm acting and living godly. And I always know that God is working behind the scenes when I'm living by faith and not living by sight. Now, Brian's going to come sing. We won't have a formal invitation. If you need counseling or to speak with somebody, speak with me or Tim or Brian after the service or contact us this week. We're here for you. I'm so glad that you're here. It's been so long I almost forgot what some of you look like. There's offering plates on each side if you need to drop that offering on your way out. And remember, an usher is going to escort you out from the back to the front after we're done singing. Brother Brian, you come. Stand together. Be not dismayed.
is so good to see you all this this morning, and uh, we are just doing our best to keep the short service as short as we can, so you don't pass out on us. We'll keep the air down. So uh, please reach out to us this week if you have any uh, questions about what we're doing in the next few weeks. Those that are uh, visiting with us uh, through our web, we hope that you will come see us uh, again soon. Thank you. God bless. Y'all have a great week.